Well, good evening, everyone, or um, afternoon as I'm recording this. Like I mentioned in last week's video, I'm kind of playing with the best format um, for how to continue to do these classes. Um, we did live stream for the most part for a long period, but what I've learned in talking with a handful of you is, is that at least a number of you like the option of being able to pause and write down. Um, so I think what I'm going to do for now, unless feedback changes that, is record these videos a little bit early. They will be posted at the same time each week that they we've been streaming, 7 p.m. on a Wednesday night, um, which is the time that you may be watching this or there's no telling when you're actually watching this. Um, and then they're just going to be available there. Um, and that way these videos are posted, they're easy to just share around, kind of unlike a live stream that can be kind of difficult. Um, there's actually some, I think, unique settings where you in Facebook can create your own watch parties, get a few friends together um, and watch these videos at the same time if that's something you're interested in doing. It just opens up a, a few other avenues. I also still value your feedback, your questions. Um, so if during these classes something comes up that um, you wanna ask some more questions about, if there's something that I share or a resource that I share, that you want to know more about or if there's a quote like over my shoulder here that you really enjoy and want to know the the source on that um, i can get all of those things to you um, i just need you talking with me so we can help make that happen um, we're still going to be continuing on doing what we've been doing looking at the gospel of matthew um, but recording in this way gives me some other resources and lets me have a, a little fun in the process so we're just gonna try it for a while and uh, we'll take feedback as we go. Um, and then, you know, <clears throat> if you want to go back to the live streams after you've given this a shot, then maybe that's what we'll do. Um, but my guess is um, the recordings offer some value that the live stream doesn't. And since it's still being posted at the same time each week, um, that shouldn't really mess with too much. Um, so uh, we're continuing on in Matthew chapter uh, 6. And we left off last week um, after the prayer with a conversation about fasting. And I, I've given you a breakdown of the Sermon on the Mount in general with what it has to say about discipleship and calling it a manual on discipleship or um, Jesus' manifesto on discipleship is probably not a perfect description, but it's a pretty accurate one. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is very concerned with um, a lived faith, which is what discipleship really means, um, what it looks like to be uh, mentored and shaped by Jesus, Jesus' life, Jesus' teachings. Um, it's given specifically to his disciples, even though there are others listening into the conversation, and it breaks down pretty cleanly uh, around the conversation of discipleship. So I'm going to slide to this section real quick, and you can see that I've given you, as bad as my handwriting is, just kind of a basic guide of how the Sermon on the Mount breaks down. We've talked about this each week. I've tried to give you a reminder. Um, the first handful of verses, 1 through 12, deal with um, how discipleship changes our, our perspectives. That's where Jesus gives um, what we commonly call the Beatitudes, these statements of blessing, which is really an encouragement to see value in hard situations. Um, and then he talks about why discipleship matters. Um, talking about... Um, followers of Jesus, disciples as the light of the world, the salt of the earth. These are the things that make life possible. Those being images of life in the ancient world, light and salt um, being important. And then letting his listeners know that discipleship matters for them um, with a hard teaching about um, exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees, which is not a throwaway line and it is not an insult um, to the Pharisees, those were people who dedicated their lives to following, for better or worse. And Jesus essentially tells his listeners that it matters that you dedicate yourself in that way. And then we get an extended section on how discipleship changes our relationships. And he talks about um, anger and jealousy, and he talks about um, adultery and divorce. He talks about how we make vows and how we pursue revenge. Um, and he looks at the ways in which genuine discipleship changes how we engage those um, relationships, those challenges or um, blessings um, at, before and after uh, with the you have heard it said, but I say um, conversation. 
And then with what we started last week and what we are continuing this week in Matthew chapter 6, right about there, um, Jesus begins to talk about how discipleship changes what we value um, and how we value it, I think, um, would be two things. And we started last week talking about um, typical Jewish acts of piety, uh, fasting and prayer and almsgiving, giving to the needy, and how um, Jesus recognizes that often the reason that people, this includes us, this is not something that's changed in the modern world, um, do good things is for very selfish purposes. Um, and in fact, that's put us in a very weird place where various uh, economists through the years have celebrated greed as if it is a good thing. Um, and they cheer um, greed as some positive driving force. Uh, Jesus leaves absolutely no room for that. Um, no room for, there's no encouragement. Like, yeah, go be greedy, but just like do good things for people along the way so you get patted on the back and it's just not there. Um, instead, uh, Jesus starts by talking about these typical acts of piety and, and then says, don't do it in public. Don't do it on the street corners. If your goal is to find applause or if your actions reveal that your heart is really into it for other people celebrating you, then you have maxed out the reward you're going to receive for that. When they applauded, you got it. That's it. Um, instead, he talks about um, the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. Um, he talks about prayer, you know, tucked away. In silence, not for, or in um, in private, not for the applause of others. He talks about prayer as a communal act, something that binds us together with other people. It's not about what we want God to do for us. It is about, um, in some ways, calling God to um, remember God's promises um, and. Um, intervene on behalf of the community in a way that matters. Uh, the language of the Lord's Prayer is very much an our, us, we language, um, not an I, me um, uh, proposal. And then he closes out by talking about fasting in very much the same way. Don't make a big deal about it. Um, and then um, with where we pick up today, he continues talking about um, again, the same kind of topic, discipleship changes what we value, but he goes after um, money and possessions, and he does so in an extended stretch, and, and some of the middle part of it we don't always recognize as being part of this same conversation, so we make it about uh, something different, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but before we dive into this evening's text, which is Matthew 6, um, verses 19 through 34, I want to slide again this direction and share with you the quote, if you haven't already read it, there we go, from Eugene Boring, who I believe was actually a long-term professor at Whitworth here in town. He's a brilliant, uh, was, I think he's passed away, um, was a brilliant, brilliant scholar. Um, and he provides a one-sentence summary of... Um, I feel like he provides a one-sentence summary here of the entire Bible, but he was writing it, talking about the section that we're talking about tonight. Um, and, and the quote is, The choice is not whether we shall serve, um, but what or whom we shall serve. Um, and I do think that's a, a question that's kind of in front of us all of the time. And tonight's verses get to that, so I want you to keep that verse, there we go, that verse, that quote in mind as we work our way um, through tonight's reading. So I'm going to start just by reading. Um, verses 19 through 34, and then we'll kind of come back and talk our way through it as we go. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eat them and rust destroy them and where theme thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will also be. The eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you will have enough food and drink nor enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more important? Uh, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? 
Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't they, uh, aren't you far more valuable than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring enough worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Um, the first thing I would point out is that in a lot of ways, these verses push us back to numerous Old Testament passages, which should be in no way surprising. But I'm thinking specifically of the 23rd Psalm, um, the Lord is my shepherd, uh, I, I shall not want, he makes me lie. And there's this recognition in the 23rd Psalm that um, God is ultimate provider. Now, I think there are um, some ways in which that can be misapplied and misinterpreted. Um, somebody could sit down in uh, the middle of nowhere and just say, well, I'm just going to sit here and wait for God. Um, there's the long story, uh, long told preacher story about the guy on the roof of a house in a flood um, who ends up dying after refusing multiple rescue opportunities because he knew God was going to his answer his prayer and God was going to rescue him. And when he asked God, why didn't you show up? God said, I sent you, you know, all these different people to help out. It's not my fault. Um, and so I think um, I want to avoid that type of reading of this passage, but I also want to make sure that we read, um, especially the conversation about worry, uh, in light of what Jesus says about wealth and reliance, because ultimately um, these verses here are about what we value most, um, what we care about, what we focus on, what our heart is oriented towards. Um, again, much like last week, in last week talking about um, a heart oriented towards self-congratulatory living where people cheer you and praise you for what you do. And that kind of moves this week towards a heart oriented um, to wealth and possessions. Um, so Jesus starts by saying, don't store up treasure here on earth um, and pushes his hearers to value different things. Now, this is especially challenging for us in a um, wealthy, comfortable culture in which we live. And that's not to say that poverty doesn't exist in our world. It absolutely does. It certainly exists in our neighborhoods um, and in our I mean, specific community. Uh, one of the things that happens from time to time is, is people share around um, posts that challenge the notion that there's poverty in the U.S. by saying, you know, the, you know three quarters of the world lives on da 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 Sure, but their economic systems are designed in a way where you can survive on that. Um, that's not to say that it, it doesn't um, constitute some level of poverty, but to disregard um, that um, paycheck to paycheck living or that um, you know people who have to, uh, can't afford their own shelter and have to house um, surf, couch surf, live in vehicles, live on the streets. Uh, those are all very real experiences of people here in our world as well. Um, and um, so to disregard um, the existence of struggle uh, around us by trivializing it, I think, is dangerous. And that's a little bit of an aside um, from the text tonight. But I, in other ways, um, it's not. Because anytime we rel uh, relativize our possessions, um, I think we miss how we treat them. Um, when we talk as if they're not important, but our actions reveal that they are deeply important to us, um, it's our actions that are telling the truth. Um, and I think about how easy it is to focus on possessions. The next thing that I want or that I think that I need. Um, you know, I, we, uh, I, we kid our kids in our house sometime. And, and if you've had kids at home, I think you can probably relate to this. Uh, commercials are just awful. Um, especially uh, commercials that pop up, you know, advertising kid stuff. 
um, because every time our kids see a single one of those commercials, they've come up with a new thing that they need for Christmas. Um, and at this point, I think if our kids got even half of what they've told us they needed for Christmas, we would have no room in our house to sleep because we would have so much junk in it. Um, I think there's something, um, however, uh, a little bit short-sighted about us poking at our kids about that, and for me personally and for those of y'all who have done it as well, because I'm guessing I'm not alone in this, while also drooling over the newest model, car, computer, uh, home upgrade, uh, anything like that. Because essentially what I'm doing is acting exactly like my kids are, but finding a way to justify it. Um, we have, uh, it is very easy for us to become oriented towards our possessions. And so Jesus talks about um, valuing something different and what can happen in us and what should happen in us when the thing we value most is his kingdom and his righteousness, which is a quote that we're going to get to a little bit later in the Sermon on the Mount, but he's building that direction. And so he looks at what we see, what we desire, really, um, by saying the eye is the lamp of the body. It is the thing that enlightens our lives. Um, so therefore, what we desire, what we stare at, um, what we value, we take in through our eyes and through other senses, and that becomes the thing that uh, steers our direction. Maybe that's the right way um, to say that. And then the verse that we miss in that little section is the last one. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Which I think is in and of itself a recognition that we are incredibly good at finding ways to justify unimportant things as the most important thing. Um, and letting that be the thing that uh, our desire rests on and we call it light, we call it good. Um, and I, I would pause right here to say, if your first reaction is of other people that do that, then you've kind of missed what I just said, uh, because my guess is you're also doing the exact same thing. Um, and the danger in there is overlooking our own ability to do the same thing. So we are able to sit back and just point at others and judge them while, you know, not recognizing the log that's in our own eye. Again, something that he's going to get to here in just a few verses. I think it's a section we end up covering um, next week. Um, but all of that's kind of going on here. And then he moves to um, what we've translated as worry. And, and that's not a bad translation, but I think the problem is uh, we have a, a bad cultural definition. We could talk about how we do a terrible job of talking about mental health. Um, but one of the things that I've heard this passage used to um, do is to say that, like, see, so... Um, all that, you know, clinical anxiety that we talk about in our world is really just a failure to rely on God. And that's absolutely false. It's a terrible way to try and read this passage. And it's important to read this passage in context for that reason. Specifically, what Jesus is talking about here is money and clothes um, and what type of those things that we get. Um, I, there's this recognition um, that uh, there's a difference between having enough and pursuing more. And I think a huge part of the undercurrent of this passage is our desire to pursue more um, when what God has already provided us, in most cases, is more than enough. And the other thing that I think sits under this passage, um, go ahead, it, it, go, it points us to the early church community. Um, and you see in... Um, in the book of Acts and in some of Paul's writings, uh, this provision of others that was um, just kind of an innate part of the church. It's what they did. So the idea of somebody in the church going without um, was uh, anathema because they all understood that there were enough resources to go around. The, the community of God had. Therefore, nobody should have to go without. And that's one of the things that happens when you learn to um, value the kingdom above your stuff. Is you learn that what you have is not necessarily yours. Um, or maybe the better way to say that is what is yours is yours to use for God, um, not to pad your own you know, bottom line stat book or, or you know, rear end. Um, 
but we don't do a very good job of living that way. Um, the caution here against storing up for tomorrow, uh, you know, in a world where we carry 401ks and retirement plans and savings accounts and you know, all of those things should at the very least catch our attention um, to start asking um, what we're saving for and if there's some value that we could um, take what we've stashed uh, that is more than enough and make sure that in, in the places um, in our church community specifically and community in general where there is not enough, we can make a difference. Um, if discipleship is oriented towards changing us and others, this is a very important part of the conversation. The challenge for churches in the modern Western world for a very long time has been this. And I'm always really interested to see um, what um, sinfulness, to use the, the traditional word, people spend the most time talking about. Um, and for the last however long, um, for longer than I've been alive, the point of conversation for churches in the United States has been sexual ethics. Um, and we've had a whole lot to say about a wide spectrum of, spe of, of sexual activity, and we've had jack to say about greed. Um, and what makes that really interesting is that if you read through the Bible, um, there's kind of an ever-changing sexual ethic, like prostitution is just kind of a given in the Old Testament. We certainly don't smile upon that now. Um, there's no real condemnation of it. Um, from God in most cases in the Old Testament. In fact, the, the one place where uh, God's like, yeah, that's not an option, is that the, the priests of Israel um, can't encourage their daughters into it. Uh, but everything else is pretty um, generic. Uh, Bible has a whole lot to say beginning to end about greed. And in fact, um, how the community of the Old Testament was formed was around a, a communal living, essentially. If you plant a field, you don't harvest the edges because people in your community need grain and they might struggle to afford grain. So make sure you leave enough unharvested for other people to clean up. There's this communal property idea. Um, and that's true in a whole bunch of other avenues that I'm not going to dive in at this moment. I say all of that to say the Bible has a ton to say about how we handle our possessions, our money, what we value in that and where we focus it. Um, and the churches in the modern world, um, in our world certainly, um, have in some ways encouraged greed without actively doing so, um, though in some cases actively doing so. That's a different conversation for a different day, um, while yelling about a bunch of other stuff. And what I would point out there is the temptation we have to ignore struggles that either um, we have and therefore don't want to say much about or wish we had, um, like having more money, while uh, being very vocal about the things that don't tempt or challenge us in any sort of significant way or aren't our problem. And what I appreciate about the Sermon on the Mount is it takes in a wide range of ethical living and asks really hard questions about what drives us, um, where our focus is, and why it matters in our relationships with others, um, friends, strangers, uh, co-workers, um, enemies, all of it. And so um, here as Jesus talks about money and possessions, he tries to remind us the danger. And he says, you cannot serve. Um, the traditional word used here in a lot of translations is God and mammon. Mammon is just an Aramaic word that means possessions, stuff. And, and it includes money, it includes property, um, it, it, everything. Um, you cannot serve God and care um, deeply about your stuff. Maybe that's a, a cleaner way to translate it for us, and certainly one that challenges us in some hard ways. Um, and so then he, he continues on talking about, and I love verse 32. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Um, I think that's a really good way um, to frame up Jesus' challenge here. What dominates your thoughts? And so very often it is money, um, pursuit of more, possession of. Um, and in the midst of the section, talking about accumulation for tomorrow, um, living on um, um, 
living with a mind in the future while ignoring the needs that are around us right now, uh, Jesus asks that question. Um, what do you... Um, what do you allow to dominate your thoughts? And I think that's probably a really good spot to wind up today's conversation. What do you allow to dominate your thoughts? Because everything kind of fits right inside that framework that we've talked about today. And I think this is a yet another one of those po uh, places where um, honest self-reflection is an incredibly important um, skill to have as a believer. Uh, it's an incredibly important skill to have, period. Um, but especially for those of us who uh, claim to value the kingdom of God above everything else, um, it's one thing to claim it, it's another thing to live it. And our actions and our attitudes betray the orientation of our heart. Um, and so um, ask hard questions about what dominates your thoughts. And if you find yourself thoroughly invested in um, the accumulation of more, or um, if you have taken in some win-at-all-cost mentality towards life, uh, that certainly dominates our political rhetoric right now, um, and are tempted to call um, those sorts of ideas light while ignoring the gospel um, or trying to conflate it with the gospel, then we've absolutely missed the point. Um, so I want to close by stepping right here and pointing out one more time Dr. Boring's quote here. Um, because what he recognizes is that we all serve something. Um, we will be um, master dominated by something. Um, it's not a question of whether or not that will happen. Um, the question is what we are going to choose it to be. Um, the choice is not whether we shall serve or but what or whom we shall serve. That question was in front of Jesus' audience, just like it is us today. And I think we have to deal with it honestly and recognize the ways in which we attempt to serve a multitude um, of masters, ideas, powers, um, and do a better job of taking a step back, um, seeing our own struggle, and reevaluating what we consider important, um, what we consider uh, uh, um, worth dedicating our life to. And uh, in the moments when we recognize that we've answered that question poorly, um, being able to change, um, to reevaluate our life um, in pursuit of God and move closer and closer to the type of disciple that the Sermon on the Mount um, offers a framework for. All right, glad you were with us. Um, hope this format works well. Give me some feedback. We'll figure it out. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll pick up next week with Matthew chapter 7 and a lovely passage on the danger of judging others, you know, involving specks and planks, and more introspection, which is, again, an important aspect of discipleship. All right, glad you're with us. We'll see you next week.